Yeah, not a lot of people know that. I, 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 he wrestled under the name El Santo. Yeah. <laughs> but I hate to tell you, it's all fake. It's fake. Oh, no. <laughs> My golden age. So, uh, we could, we're going to just do a Q&A now? I guess so. Yeah, we we our yeah. yeah we're going to do a short Q&A. Yesterday we covered a whole lot of things. I guess we should use these. Oh, yeah. Um, we covered a lot of the life and times from Mr. Clark yesterday, and his bio is a must. His autobiography is a must. And it's on his table as well as other people. You know, uh, somebody, John, I don't remember which John, because there was a number of them that bought the book yesterday. I got back to the room and I opened my email, and there was a tremendous email from the guy. He said, uh, he was a fan of joysticks, that's why he bought the book. So he said, in my book, it's my autobiography of all the films that I've made, and I do it in, in chronological order, from the first film, including Satan Sadists, up until my last film. And I directed 20 films uh, in the 70s, 80s, 90s, and 2000s. And Joysticks, I think Joysticks was my 10th film, if I remember it, right in the middle of my career. And uh, so anyhow, the guy <clears throat> said he started, he jumped right to the chapter on joysticks because each of my films is a chapter in my book. And he said he loved it so much, he was so involved in it that even though he had made plans to party last night, he decided he should go to the front of the book and start reading. And he said he stayed up all night reading it and he loved it and he was so appreciative and so forth. So. Anyhow, that, I, I liked it. I wrote the book because my two sons just insisted that uh, I write the book. Because I didn't have kids until I was an old man, uh, almost 40 before I had them. And uh, uh, because I was struggling so much, I couldn't afford it. But then I got lucky and made some money. So my wife said, hey, my, my clock is ticking. And I said, well, we'll get you a new wristwatch or something. But no, she wanted babies. So had a couple of boys. Anyhow, they insisted that I write my autobiography. And I ended up writing it in a screenplay format. Instead of a regular paragraph and so on, I did it like it was a screenplay. And I did that because I'd written so many screenplays over the years. Of the 20 features that I directed, uh, I wrote probably 17 or 18 of them. And I also wrote a couple of uh, screenplays that were done that I did not direct, that I acted in early in my career. So I ended up writing it as a screenplay and uh, you know the response to it has been overwhelming. I, I, I'm almost embarrassed because when you write something like that you expect people online to tell you how terrible it was and so on. But literally everybody that has responded has responded positive. Well and one of the things I think that really shines through it is you're a writer. I mean, not all directors are. And well, so, yeah, and so that, um, you know, not to say that directors aren't intelligent, etc., but when you're already a writer, I think that your writing is going to show, your writing skills show through in the book. Well, thank you. Uh, again, when I started it, uh, I sat down and I began to write it just like a normal autobiography with paragraphs and so on, but then I slipped into the screenplay format without even realizing it, and then I decided, well, I'll just make it as if it was a screenplay. One of the cool things about joysticks that we didn't talk about yesterday is not only are you exploiting the um, you know the video game fad going on, but um, you also insert these punk characters with Vidiot being one of the most hilarious <laughs> media representations of punk rock ever. Um, how did you come to think of it? Was it that simple? They just wanted to include that subculture in the movie since it was in the media? Or? Well, yes, I, I, I think it was. Uh, in Joysticks, I don't particularly like movies, especially teenage comedy movies, where one group is hated by the other group and they, you know, they don't get along and, and they, they make fun of each other. So I didn't want that. I wanted them all to get along and to like each other, although the Vidiots, the, the, the punk group, was a bit ostracized. They were still allowed into the arcade and still allowed to play and so forth. And and, and so I, I did need a bit of an antagonist uh, uh, beyond the parents who were the main antagonist trying to close the arcade down. 
But uh, these guys just watched, uh, or many of them, I guess, uninvited. A any questions about anything? Okay, thanks all for coming. I appreciate it. No. Yeah, I wanted to ask, uh, <clears throat> I do believe uh, Joe Don Baker was in that picture. Yes. Scott. How is it working with uh, Joe Don Baker? You know, Joe Don is, a, is terrific. I made three pictures with Joe Don. Uh, the first picture is a picture called Wacko, which was a comedy spoof of horror films. This is uh, before all those that were made after that. And uh, I tried to get Joe Don on a picture just previous to Wacko, a picture called The Return. And uh, he was having family difficulties. His, his aunt who raised him was... Uh, had ill, was ill and was about to pass away and he just didn't want to work. So I never met him, but I tried to get through his agent and that's the information that I got back. So anyhow, I made that and Jan Michael Vincent uh, took that role. Anyhow, I made that picture and then a year went by and I was ready to make Wacko. And I thought, gee, Joe Don comedy. Well, he's a great actor. He hasn't done comedy that I was aware of, but let me get the script to his agent and see if he would be interested. So I got the script to him and the agent read it and then the agent passed it on to Joe Don and Joe Don loved it and wanted to do it. We had not met. So the agent says to me, uh, Joe Don's price I think was two hundred or two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. This goes back to 1982, 81. And uh, uh, I said, well, you know, I can't afford that, you know, but uh, I don't have that much money. The agent said, well, what would you be able to pay? So I said, I could stretch it to $150,000. He said, well, that's not enough, but I'll talk to my client. Or to make a long story short, Joe Don agreed to meet me. And they wanted to meet at the Beverly Hills Hotel in the uh, coffee shop there. <laughs> called the Polo Lounge, and uh, so I went over, I, I didn't live in Beverly Hills, I lived in the valley, so I drove over the hill to meet with uh, Joe Don for the first time and his agent. And uh, Joe Don said to me, because uh, I told him $150,000 for three weeks work, and the part that he has is certainly one of the stars, if not the star in the picture. So we met there and, and uh, uh, Joe Don was a little bit of a drinker at the time and I was not, which was fine, you know, and he had a couple of drinks and I had Coke or whatever I had. So uh, he says to me, Graydon, how are you gonna do this and shoot me in three weeks? It's impossible because I'm, I'm throughout the movie. And I think my shooting schedule, actually that picture, my shooting schedule was a little longer than I usually had. I think I had six weeks. And I had scheduled Joe down for three. He said, how are you going to do me in three weeks? I guess that, this is not really a spoiler alert because it's not that kind of movie. But Joe Don plays, plays two characters. He plays a cop who's obsessed with the lawnmower killer, uh, which is a pumpkin-headed killer who's killing teenagers. And he's trying to prevent this from happening. And it's Friday the 13th, it's prom night, and uh, uh, October 31st, Halloween night, all rolled into one. And uh, so Joe Don plays two characters. He plays the killer in a pumpkin-headed costume, and then with his real face as this cop. And he said, uh, you're not going to double me as the killer I said, well, yeah, of course I am, Joe Don. I can't, I can't afford to have you work, I think it would have been five weeks instead of three weeks. So when you're in the pumpkin head and you have the costume on, I'll have an actor doubling you. He said, well, then I don't want to do the movie. He said, I want to do the whole thing. And I said, well, I'd love to have you do the whole thing, but I only have $150,000, and I, so I can only afford you for three weeks. He said... I'll do the whole thing for five weeks, the same price. Well, his agent about passed out because he was sitting at the table next to me. And I said, deal. I shook his hand. I said, thanks. Nice meeting you. We'll be in touch with the wardrobe. And I got the hell out of there because I knew his agent was going to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. So Joe Don did the whole movie five weeks for 150 grand. <clears throat> and
and he was great to work with. He was, he was inventive, he was cooperative. George Kennedy was also in the movie. And uh, when I got George, George said to me, he called, uh, you, you work through the agents, but once you get a basic agreement, then the actor often calls you and wants to talk to you about, do you know anything about directing? So, which I fooled most of them most of the time. So, <laughs> so uh, George Kennedy said to me, is it true you have Joe Don Baker playing the part of Harbinger was the cop's name? I said, yeah. He said, I love Joe Don Baker. Did you know he was in Cool Hand Luke? Uh, Joe Don, uh, excuse me, George Kennedy won the Academy Award for Cool Hand Luke, and Joe Don Baker played one of the extras, just one of the guys in the chain gang. I said, oh yeah, I did, I did know that. He said, and did you know he, he was great in Charlie Varick, which was a, uh, he played a uh, Texas bad guy tracing uh, Walter Matthau. So I said, yeah, he was great. He said, oh, if Joe Don's in it, I'll do it. I've always wanted to work with him. I said, great. Turned out they had one short scene together in the whole movie. But, uh, so George was terrific to work with. Joe Don, I ended up doing two more pictures, three total. I took him to Malta with me where I, uh, after we did Wacko, then I made Joysticks. Joe Don was in it. And we really got along well. We went to Laker games and so on. He was a terrific guy. So then some people came to me from Malta and said, uh, would I make a movie there? And I said, the only thing I know about Malta is, is you have falcons. I, I, I didn't even know where it was on the map. Little island off the coast of Italy. And they had a film studio there. And they wanted me to come over and direct a picture there. And they wanted me to bring an American star with me. So, Joe Don was from Texas. Uh, very soft-spoken, gentle, intelligent uh, fellow who left Texas uh, when he was, I guess, certainly out of school to go to New York to study at the actor's studio. So he was a real professional, serious actor. But he was still a Texas guy. So I thought, well, okay, I'll write a script specifically for Joe Don, about a Texas sheriff who, but I had to make the whole movie in Malta, but a Texas sheriff who uh, gets involved in an extradition case to take a mafiosa back to Rome. The mafiosa's people force the plane down in Malta, the mafiosa escapes, and Joe Don, uh, cat and mouse between the mafiosa and him for the rest of the movie. So Joe Don was great to work with, but he, he didn't particularly like to work. I don't want to say he was lazy, because he wasn't lazy. I, I, I don't know why. I mean, he turned down a sequel to uh, uh, Walking Tall. And they were throwing so much money at him. It was unbelievable. And he kept saying no, and they would offer him more money, and no, they would offer him more money. Eventually, they made the sequel with uh, Bo Svensson from Scandinavia. I don't know which, which Scandinavian country. Anyhow. So those are the three pictures I did with Joe Don. Terrific fella, wonderful guy. Can't speak highly enough about him. You got you. You know, a lot of people would say you got a lot of guys that were on the downhill slide, but I wouldn't even say downhill slide because they they just couldn't find work in A movies anymore, and they went to, of course, the B movies. And you had two guys, Martin Lando and Jack Palance, who were basically doing a lot of these low-end films, and eventually they both won Best Supporting Actor Academy Awards. Isn't that amazing? Uh, we did, I did Without Warning in, in 1980, uh, and had both Jack Palance and Marty Landau. Mar Marty was very gregarious, talking to the crew and the other cast, just, just, a, just an all-around pleasant, good-time Charlie guy. Very professional, knew his lines, worked with the actors, great. Palance was very professional knew his lines, but didn't want to talk to anybody. He wanted to go back to his trailer and and uh, uh, study his lines, what have you. But he was not unpleasant, just kind of standoffish. So, what amazed me about working with these guys like that? Now, Palance I had on Without Warning for one week, and Marty Landau I had for one week. And it was the, first, the second time I'd worked with Palance, first time with Lando. And uh, I was always amazed 
not only with those two guys, but Joe Don and George Kennedy and Clu Gulliger and and uh, guys I worked with, uh, Ralph Meeker, uh, Neville Brand, three or four pictures. I was always amazed that these old-time professional actors would come to the set completely prepared, willing to work, willing to take direction, working with almost always inexperienced young people who were really the leads in the picture. And uh, uh, I had to shoot them on very short shooting schedules because, again, I think I paid Palance for warning $50,000 for one week and 25000 to Landau for one week. That was 75000 and I had 150000 total to make the picture. So those two guys took half my budget. But anyhow, they were always, they never said, ah, oh, this is a little cheap little picture that I'm working on for one week, and, you know, I'll shine it on a, no, just the opposite. I was always astonished that how seriously, because I took everything seriously because I had to, and wanted to, but these guys were all very, very professional fellows. So two or three years go by after Without Warning, Palace had won his Academy Award for City Slickers, and the next year or the year after Marty Landau won his Academy Award for Ed Wood, Landau called me afterwards and said, Greg, we both won, you must be good luck. And I said, uh, Marty, believe me, I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> So, uh, but great guys, and very serious uh, working people. Did you ever hear the story about, they worked together again on this film called Alone in the Dark? You know, I'm not, yes, yes, I, I've been told that on numerous occasions, but I want to say that may have been done before mine. Yeah, because something, uh, I, you, Rush, you would even know, they shot it up by us, Rochelle Park, yeah, the hole yeah. in the wall that I guess there was a lot of drugs on the set with the director involved and Jack basically went on a tirade that he hated doing this, he, he couldn't do this low budget stuff anymore and he wanted out and they walked up to Martin Landau and they said, well how do you feel? And he goes, this is all I've been doing for the last three years. <laughs> director well, was here a few shows ago. Really? Yeah. Door, yeah. I, uh, I never had a problem with an actor, experienced actor. With one exception, one of the guys had a drug problem and he was a sweet, kind, wonderful guy till about noon. Then he would be so stoned, he would say, ah, oh, great, you're, you're, you're Jim, so Jim great. Michael you're, Vincent. What, what, do you, what, what do you want? Just tell me what, you know. And I would say to him, I would say, Jan, what I want you to do is to be sober a full day so we can work. Because I had to restage stuff to sit him down because he couldn't walk. And mm. Mm. Sweet guy, nice guy, but had a real problem. And, you know, I'm sure we all know people who've had the monkey on their back and he just couldn't handle it. He's in terrible shape now. Oh, yeah, well, well, I did the picture with him in, uh, actually, it was just after, without warning. So, I had a great cast. I had Sybil Shepherd and Marty Landau again, and uh, uh, Raymond Burr, and Neville Brand, and Jan Michael Vincent is who we're talking about. And Jan, uh, I've told this story so many times, I feel, I don't think I've told it here, so if I have, just jump up and say, shut up. Uh, Sometimes, or often, there's a few scenes where you have to redo the dialogue because an airplane flew over or some screw up someplace. And that's called, it used to be called looping, now it's known as ADR, Automatic Dialogue Replacement. And you bring the actor back into a sound stage oh, six or eight weeks after you're finished shooting, once you've edited the picture and you know exactly what words need to be replaced. So we finished the picture, six or eight weeks later, I called Jan Michael, again working through his agent, to come into the sound stage to do his ADR. And when you make a deal with, with actors, uh, especially stars, and I paid a lot of money to Jan Michael, a lot, uh, it always includes a day or two of looping after the film, or a day or two of ADR after the film is finished. So <laughs> I called Jan's agent and I say, okay, we need Jan. 12 o'clock at such and such a sound stage. And uh, I was afraid he wasn't even going to show up. And I, if so, I didn't know what I was going to do. Anyhow, the door opens, he's there on time, he walks in, he's clear-eyed, he's fantastic looking, he looks better than he ever looked, or at least as good as he looked on Hooper. And uh, he came up to me, he said, great, great, now I want to apologize what I did to you on this show, I feel so... Uh, 
and and it was a picture that I, I like. I I like all my films. Some I like better than others, and some days I like one better than others. But uninvited, I I, I like for a lot of reasons. It, it was fun. But what happened is, I was in Malta making Final Justice, and they had a huge tank there that uh, uh, Dino De Laurentiis from Italy had built to do one of his uh, pirate movie things. A, a gigantic tank. I would say the tank was maybe four or five football fields square. And it was about three feet, four feet deep cement. And it overlooked the Mediterranean so that when the water was up to where it should be, you could look out and it would look like the Mediterranean Sea. You could go forever. And yet it was only four feet and it was cement underneath. And so they could move equipment, lights and cameras or what have you on dollies and guys could just push them. It's terrific for filming. So uh, I didn't use it much on Final Justice because I, when I wrote the script, I didn't even know it existed. But when I got over there and I saw it, I thought, wow. So I did put a couple of scenes of Final Justice using the tank. But I thought, hey, I'm going to come back to Malta and I'm going to make a movie on board a big ship, a yacht. Uh, I don't know what it's going to be, but I'm going to use that tank. Because I was using Maltese crews, and they were very good and, and very, very cooperative. I found that I ended up making some pictures in Russia. Every crew that I ever worked with, from the lowest budget in the United States to low budgets in Russia, every single person on it was doing the absolute best they could do and were interested in working to make the best film. When you hear a critic say, ah, they just shined it on, they didn't care, that critic doesn't know what he's talking about. Picture may not work, critic may not like the picture, that's another story. But every single person on any set that I was on cared about the picture and did the best. So, anyhow, <laughs> I, I go back to Los Angeles where I was living with the idea of writing something that I could make in this tank in Malta. So I started around, okay, a bunch of people are on this ship and a rat comes on board. And it's a poisonous rat and, and uh, it's, it's killing the people and they have to defend themselves and so on. So I write the script and my wife said to me, who wants to see a movie about a rat? I said, well, Willard did pretty good. Said, yeah, but that's one time people, you know, why don't you make it something else? So, you know, I thought, oh, okay, that's not, I probably shouldn't make it a rat. So I came out on the idea of making it a cat. And cats aren't poisonous, but then I thought, well, i got to make it poisonous somehow. Well, what if there was a rat-like character living inside the cat? <laughs> so, so I write the script. I get on a plane, I fly to Malta. And I say, okay, guys, I need a yacht, a big one, because I have chases between the cat and the people. And uh, they kept taking me to really nice yachts, but I needed three times the size of this room in, in area to, to make it interesting so the cat could hide, then eventually the people could hide, etc., etc. Well, they couldn't find a luxury yacht. So I leave there, I go to Jamaica. I had contacted production people in all the places before I went, obviously. And each one said, oh, we can get you a boat, great, no problem, no problem. So I go to Jamaica, and again, the, the, the ships they were showing me were about the size of this room, and I needed two or three times this size. So I went back to L.A., and I, I said, I can't make this movie. What can I do? I can't, I can't find a, a yacht, a ship big enough. Which was stupid of me, because I should have known that, that it, to, to, to get a big to a ship to handle all these scenes would be way out of my budget. So I about gave up on making Uninvited. And my wife said to me, why don't you go down to the marina in L.A., the harbor, and see if there's anything there. All right, so I jumped in the car, drove down to the marina, and they had beautiful yachts. But again, like they were showing me in Malta and Jamaica, you know, a yacht certainly that I couldn't begin to afford, but nothing anywhere near big enough. So I, I talked to the uh, to a guy that ran a little coffee shop at one of the marinas, and I was saying, I need really a big ship. 
what can I do? He said, well, you're not going to find any in a, in a marina. You're talking about the kind of ships that come in to Long Beach, to the uh, San Pedro Harbor. He said, you've got to go down there. So I went down there. <clears throat> I talked to a security guard. He said, no, all of our stuff is uh, commercial with the, uh, <clears throat> you know, cargo coming in from Asia. He said, but you know what? There is a, a big yacht that has been for sale for months, and I think the guy just sold it, and he's taking it up to Seattle for delivery to the purchaser. So he told me where, where to find it, and I'm walking through these big ships with cargo containers and everything. I turn a corner, and oh my God, there's a beautiful, huge, white yacht. And I swear I saw the ghost of uh, Aristotle and Nash standing on the balcony. So I go and I find out who owns it. Yeah, it's just been sold. And the guy says, okay, it's going to be here in Los Angeles for another four weeks. And then off we go. <clears throat> so since he sold it, I was able to make a very good deal with him. I said, look, I'll give you, I think I gave him, I don't know, three or $4,000 for three weeks of use. He said, but look, don't come to me and say you need it for a day after such and such a date because I've sold this for more than a million dollars. It's going to Seattle. So then I was able to make the picture. Am I going on too much about this? You're great, no. Okay. So then I realized, damn, I've done, I've done it again. I'd written that the yacht sinks and the, the main area floods from a storm. <coughs> what the hell? How can I, I can do that? Well, I could go to one of the studios and shoot in their tanks. But that would be half of my budget for the whole movie. So I'm thinking, Jesus, maybe I can't make this movie. And I, I was living in a fairly nice house by that time, and I had a swimming pool. And I'm sitting there thinking, what the hell, how can I, I can't afford to go to one of the sound stages and use their tank. And I'm looking, and I think, wait a minute, don't I have a tank? Yeah, it's outside, but maybe I, if the, sink, the sinking is going to take place at night. So when you're at night, you only see what you light. So if I don't light the exterior and I just light the swimming pool, and if I bring into my pool, in the shallow end of the pool, if I bring in, I build my set, uh, the guy's uh, a, a bedroom where he lived, uh, the, the, the guy that owned the yacht <coughs> had a very luxurious room, you know, and I, I said, okay, I could build that and put it in the shallow end of the pool and it would be a three-walled set and uh, I could keep the camera on the, on the cement apron and then just occasionally go in with the camera on the shoulder, go into the pool and shoot the stuff. <clears throat> so the set then I needed to have the actors in before it sank. So I built that set in my garage. <laughs> And we shot the scenes with the actors uh, doing whatever they do in the, in the set. <laughs> then, during lunch hour, I had my crew take the set out of my garage, put it in my swimming pool, and we, we did it in, in the, so that by the time lunch hour closed, it had become night. So now it's night, I cranked up the heat in the pool to make it steam, and I brought my actors in, I brought the camera in, and was able to shoot that final scene in my swimming pool and garage. <laughs> Movie magic. How are we doing on time, Mark? I mean, we we um, we should probably see if anyone has any questions mm -hmm. and then let um, Greater return to his table where he has many more stories, an awesome autobiography, and some really cool memorabilia. I scored oh, a yeah. Japanese joystick poster ah, for me when you were here yeah, last yeah. time. You put a Japanese joystick off me last show, if I remember right. What's that? You bought a Japanese joystick off me last show. No. Oh. The, uh, I bought a poster from Great Music. All of my film, uh, yeah, all of my films played overseas. A lot of them really well overseas. <clears throat> because my films were exploitation fun films. Films that you could enjoy and what have you. And if you were in uh, Oshkosh, you could enjoy them. And if you were in uh, Scandinavia or Italy or Germany, without warning, was a huge hit in Germany. Uh, I don't know, it struck a... And in France, and in fact, without warning, in France, won the best sci-fi film fantastique 
best sci-fi film award for the year that it, it opened. I was I was over there. Uh, when was I over there? I don't know. I mean, within the last year, <clears throat> they had me come over for a signing thing, and uh, I was amazed. They, they said every little kid in France was flinging stuff at them at their buddies like like they were the alien. Thanks, guys. And here's a great report.